Wuhan, Hubei province in central China. Once a thriving metropolis, now a city of 11 million people on lockdown. China has instituted the greatest effort to reduce travel that we've seen in modern history. Across the world, one by one, cities came to a shutdown. The hugely exponential manner in which it has spread, there is now a sense of alarm. Medical facilities pushed to the brink amid the urgent call to contain the virus. We're not trying to stop this outbreak from coming. We're trying to stop it coming quickly. How did a newly emerged coronavirus manage to hold the entire world at its mercy? Why was advanced medical research not able to combat its spread? And is this merely the start of other potentially unstoppable global pandemics? December 2019 in Wuhan, central China. Something strange was happening to the residents. People were suddenly falling ill. People like Wang Wei's father. Thinking it was about of winter flu, Wang Wei's family played safe and took dad to the hospital. At the hospital, there were a host of cases, just like Wang Wei's father. The doctors were growing alarmed. In a matter of days, experts realized that this mystery flu was in fact a new infectious virus and one that threatened to spread rapidly. Scientists in China are trying to determine if a new virus strain is responsible for an ammonia outbreak in the city of Wuhan. Scientists around the world hurried into action in a collective effort to understand this new virus, where it came from, how it might behave, and crucially, what could be done to stop it. By late December, Wuhan health authorities had reported 27 pneumonia cases to the World Health Organization. While not all of them were seriously ill, all the victims shared a common link, which raised alarms. The link was a seafood wholesale market in Wuhan, where exotic livestock was also being sold. All the patients had visited or worked there. Wet market is the most dangerous place, and it's really suited for virus transmission. Scientists have been warning about the danger of the wet market for at least half a century. And what exactly is that danger? It's that somehow an animal virus makes a giant leap across species into humans. Zoonotic disease, by the simple definition, means it's animal to human. So in a live market, you can have more than 100 different live animal species traded under the same roof. In their own quest for survival, viruses constantly seek new opportunities to reproduce and spread, including potential new host species. Viruses are the perfect intracellular parasites, so to say, because once they gain entry into the cell, it is able to use the host machinery to make more of its own. But the process of a virus jumping from one species to another is not a simple one. Typically, it ends in failure due to the genetic dissimilarity of the two hosts. Because of the virus's ability to reproduce by the billions, they can mutate and fast. Most mutations won't help the virus into a new target, but by pure chance and numbers, just one lucky mutation can allow it to transition into a new species. Over time, the odds of the virus successfully making the leap will increase. 
that's why live market is a dangerous place because the virus has a chance to make contact with lots of different animals. And by trying to arrow, if one gets up, will either give to human or further contaminate the whole market through fecal material, urines, blood, because some animals are slaughtered in the market. So I have seen blood, you know, people were using hoses to try to hose down blood. That's an incredible way of transmitting the virus. When a virus transitions from an animal into humans, it can lead to a number of consequences, from the innocuous to the deadly. There's one that can cause symptoms but doesn't spread further. A good example of that is rabies. A dog bites a human, humans get rabies, they don't pass it on to other persons. Then there's emergence, which occurs sometimes periodically, such as Ebola, which causes outbreaks, sometimes very vicious and serious outbreaks, but then it's controlled, it disappears, and it emerges again. And then there are some viruses which emerge from the animal kingdom into humans and become permanent residents. And a good example of that is HIV infection, which is thought to have emerged actually in the late 19th or early 20th century from a, a non-human primate into a human. Scientists in China quickly made a breakthrough and identified the pathogen as a coronavirus. Under an electron microscope, the coronavirus looks like it has a crown around it. That's why it's called a coronavirus. The crown around it is actually protein that helps the virus enter into human cells. There are actually some which are permanent residents in the human population. They're endemic and they cause common colds. And then there are others that emerge from time to time from nature, and these are usually coronaviruses that have mutated in such a way that they become more severe infections in humans. A previous outbreak of a coronavirus threatened the world in 2003, SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, that killed more than 700 people worldwide. But despite the experience gained handling the SARS pandemic, Scientists were now grappling against this new coronavirus outbreak. SARS-CoV-2 seems to be more transmissible than SARS, and it spreads during the incubation period, so the period between which a person has been infected but not yet developed symptoms of the virus, whereas SARS did not spread during the incubation period, and that made it somewhat easier to contain. The experts leading the investigation into the new coronavirus were zeroing in on the Huanan wet market. Chinese authorities shut it down, and the samples taken there suggested that, like SARS, the new virus may have first originated in bats. Bats are unique mammals. Now we have around 5,000 living species of mammal, and 20% of them, so every one out of five, is a bat. Bats, as the only flying mammal, they have a very unique immune defense system, so they don't get sick from virus. Fortunately, the transmission of bat virus to human is a very rare event and very difficult. So currently we know that most of the bat bone virus that cause zoonotic disease in human has to be transmitted through an intermediate animal. In Wuhan, the focus was now on finding what this missing link could be. Identifying this could help stop any further outbreaks. There's a lot of speculation about this animal X. So we're talking about most likely a bat virus transmit to an intermediate host, we call it animal X. Just what animal X is was the subject of wild speculation. Of the possible candidates, some suggested a snake, others a civet cat, and even a pangolin. The science is still unclear, but Lin Fa Wang is confident of one thing. You always learn from your experience that animal X is most likely a mammal. Scientists were racing to learn more about this novel coronavirus. And on the 11th of February, 2020, the World Health Organization officially named it SARS-CoV-2. And the disease it causes, COVID-19. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern. Increasingly urgent attempts by nations around the world to contain the spread were proving futile. And with that, a new worry was emerging. 
the virus was starting to gain critical mass. Viral pneumonia has hit central China's Wuhan city. Scientists in China quickly made a breakthrough and identified the pathogen as a coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2 seems to be more transmissible than SARS. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern. Now coordinating their efforts, China and the WHO were sharing what information they could about the novel coronavirus. They were able to identify this as a new coronavirus in a much shorter period. But still, there's so many things we still don't know. The clearinghouse for all the information today is the World Health Organization. And WHO takes that information, sifts through it, makes sure that what they have is valid, and then they do a regular, almost daily risk assessment and the evidence they have and makes recommendations. It's in control rooms like this one in Manila that the WHO plans its response. For it to work, much depends on countries sharing data effectively. Typically what they're looking at is who's getting sick, why are they getting sick, how are they getting sick, and then immediately you already start trying to figure out how do you stop the outbreak. One way to unlock the secrets of a virus is to look at its genetic code. Within days of disclosing the outbreak, Chinese scientists discovered the virus's genetic sequence and shared it with the world. What's very important is that since maybe 20 or 30 years, we can now do a genetic sequence of a new virus. That means we can understand how the building blocks of the virus are put in place. And we can also tell, in many instances, where the virus came from and where it's going. And once we had the genetic sequence of this coronavirus, it was possible to identify that it was very similar genetically. About 80% of its genetic makeup was similar to that of the SARS virus. But even when there are close genetic similarities between viruses of the same family, this doesn't mean they will necessarily behave the same way. When you have a 20% difference, that's a lot of difference. So yes, they're related, but in terms of trying to learn from SARS and how to prevent a novel coronavirus, we can use some of the knowledge, but I think that we cannot just transfer the SARS knowledge to this coronavirus, and we still have to do the basic science. The question is, how does that virus manifest itself in humans? In Wuhan, the novel coronavirus took its first life. The victim was a 61-year-old man who had visited the Huanan wet market. Disturbingly, some five days later, his wife, who had not gone to the market, was also confirmed to have the coronavirus. It showed for the first time that the virus was able to spread from human to human, an ominous development. Viruses can be transmitted between individuals in a variety of ways. Some viruses only spread through contact with blood. Other viruses are what we would call airborne. That's where the virus is able to bind to small dust particles in the air and continue to live on that dust particle for a period of time, such that when it's blown by the wind, it's still there and that could travel quite a long distance. And there's droplet transmission where you're in relatively close contact to someone and you may, if they sneeze or cough, you may come into contact with those droplets and become infected. Early research suggested the new virus could survive outside of the body for significant periods. It could drift, suspended, in the air for hours and remain viable for days on hard surfaces, such as metal. It was clear to scientists that this novel coronavirus was highly transmissible. Occasionally, one individual turns out to be far more likely to spread the virus than others. If a person is infected and have a sneeze, for example, they can release hundreds of thousands of millions of virus into the air, depends on, again, the patient. Some people, when they sneeze, they only release a small number of virus. Others release not large number of virus, and we call these people as super spreaders. 
So if we can infect one or two, you know, that's not a super spread. If they infect more than 10, then it becomes a super spreader. With cases jumping exponentially in Hubei province and seeping outside of its borders, the outbreak was rapidly escalating into an epidemic. China has probably instituted the greatest effort to reduce travel from an area that we've seen in modern history, certainly re uh, related to an outbreak. Overnight, Wuhan was transformed into a ghost town. Train stations, normally crowded with commuters, now deserted. Previously bustling restaurants and shops were suddenly emptied. Streets and roads now barren, as Wuhan's residents kept themselves indoors. When we're dealing with uh, outbreaks of uh, unknown pathogens, so that's the thing you have not seen before, it's better to overreact than underreact. Of course, you have the danger of being claimed to get things wrong. But I think that it's much better to be wrong than not reporting and people dying. Containing a new and virulent virus is no easy feat, and that task is made even tougher in a city that is also one of the biggest transport hubs in the country. Wuhan is located almost in the center of China, and it has a very large transportation network going in. And then there is a tremendous number of people which are flying into Wuhan from other parts of China and other parts of the world. Despite the extraordinary effort to quarantine the city, it did not contain the virus. The virus, it seemed, had its own type of stealth mode, where victims displayed no symptoms in the early stages of infection, helping the pathogen spread ever wider among unsuspecting people. The reproductive number for this coronavirus outbreak was estimated to be at about 2.6. That assumes that any one person may go on to infect two or three other people. As a result, the spread can very rapidly get out of control, particularly when some people aren't displaying symptoms during its incubation period. The novel virus was proving to be far more adept at reproducing itself than even SARS. In just a quarter of the time, SARS-CoV-2 had caused 10 times as many cases. So we know COVID-19 spreads early in the course of the illness. So SARS would spread, um, particularly in hospitals, as patients got sicker and the viral load went higher. This is a different disease. This has mostly community transmission. And it's obviously happening very early, like in the first couple of days. And we've got, even got examples of it happening before the symptoms started. The odds were seemingly stacked against the scientists. This was a highly elusive virus and one that was spreading among people much faster than anticipated. 10 days before the unprecedented lockdown in China to prevent its spread, the virus had already made its first appearance on foreign soil. In Wuhan, the new coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 had taken its first life. The victim, a 61-year-old man, was one of the first cluster of cases connected to the Huanan wet market. The question is, how does that virus manifest itself in humans? When we're dealing with uh, outbreaks of uh, unknown pathogens, it's better to overreact than underreact. Overnight, Wuhan was transformed into a ghost town. By the 23rd of January, there were 570 reported cases, 17 deaths in China, and 11 million people under quarantine in Wuhan. In spite of the lockdown, the virus had already moved beyond China's borders. The first international case was in Thailand. Thailand has reported the first case of the Wuhan coronavirus found outside of China. Spurred into action, scientists across the globe worked against the clock to slow the spread, with the WHO at the center of the effort. China, 
They detect these uh, unknown diseases and identify the coronavirus in a very short period, and they share all those sequences to the other countries. So we're daily receiving these informations and analyzing information and sharing the informations to member states. As well as the sharing of data, a vital step in checking a virus's spread comes through tracing every person an infected patient has been in contact with. Contact tracing is identifying all persons who have had contact with a known person to be infected, either before the infection began or afterwards. And those people are isolated. They're asked to isolate, either self-isolate, or sometimes they're put in quarantine. And they're monitored for a period of up to three weeks to see whether or not they develop signs and symptoms. In China, the task of contact tracing was an enormous undertaking. In Wuhan alone, more than 1,800 epidemiologists were tracing tens of thousands of contacts a day. But it quickly proved its worth. Between 1% and 5% of contacts were subsequently confirmed cases of COVID-19. But there was one group of possible cases which confounded scientists. There are some people who might be infected with a virus and at no point do they develop any symptoms whatsoever. So they don't even feel tired or have muscle aches and pains. They are asymptomatic. And that can become quite concerning because we then don't know what the, the background level of viral infection is in the population. With cases racking up, governments around the world were starting to pay close attention and begin their own outbreak preparations. Well, airlines have begun suspending flights as fears mount over the coronavirus epidemic. Aviation regulator DGCA has asked airports and airlines to begin screening passengers arriving from Japan and South Korea. Containment was now a key strategy against COVID-19. To minimize the risks of importing infected individuals, countries began restricting flights from affected regions. Countries are doing a number of things to try to protect themselves. One of them is that they are simply monitoring what is going on in China to try to get a sense of what might be working, what is not working. A second thing is that some countries have taken steps to reduce the amount of travel between China and their country, or people coming from China have been put into quarantine. Now, I got back from China four days ago. I was uh, part of the, the, the WHO Joint China Mission, so as is undertaken in Singapore and in fact lots of countries around the world, there's a 14-day home quarantine order for people that are returning from areas of, of high transmission. So I'm staying home, I'm doing all my usual work, but, uh, but I'm doing it from my, from my desk and my, my office at home. As the global shutdown on travel grew, the reality was that scientists were not able to halt the virus. They had a different, more pragmatic objective. We're not trying to stop this outbreak from coming. We're trying to stop it coming quickly. If it comes too quickly, then health services get overwhelmed and mortality rates increase when the health systems can't cope. Most healthcare systems already operate at near capacity. This outbreak had the potential to overwhelm some. The scientific advice was to try to buy time. The hospitals have a very difficult job. One, they have to take care of the patient safely, but they also have to make sure that their healthcare workers are safe. So they want to make sure that they have enough rooms to put patients in. You want to have transportation means like ambulances, which are safe. And you also want to have um, a health system, a hospital or clinic, which can take care of patients safely. In Wuhan, hospitals were struggling to cope with the influx of patients. Li Hua, a resident of the city, had a friend who was struck by the virus, but she wasn't receiving any medical treatment. So at the very beginning, I think when she had the symptoms, she went to the hospital and the doctor diagnosed her with the disease, but wasn't able to take her into the hospital because they're very limited to the amount of, um, you know, doctors and, and beds they have in the, in the hospital. So they actually sent her home to be quarantined. But I think this is a, this is a special situation where you just have limited resource, right? With the world's eyes on Wuhan, 
the Chinese authorities were spurred into even greater action. In an unprecedented effort, authorities built and repurposed an extra 16 hospitals in a matter of weeks. It was thanks to these efforts that patients such as Li Wa's friend were finally able to receive medical treatment. It took about a week since she was admitted to the hospital. She told me she's, she's been getting better since then. Beyond China's borders, another country with a vast population was also bracing for the outbreak, India. Home to more than a billion people, second only to China in its number of citizens. In the middle of December, when we first heard about the unusual pneumonia that was happening in China, I called together our team of scientists and I told them, you know, we must have a preparedness team. A month into the outbreak, India confirmed its first case of COVID-19. Priya and her team were taking no chances. We were the first to initiate testing for the whole country. The first three positives were detected here. At Priya's lab, another possible case sample arrived for testing. Known as a PCR test, a sample, such as a throat swab, is taken from the patient. The test scans through the genetic material in the sample and searches for the presence of telltale coronavirus RNA, taking just hours to detect whether the sample is positive or negative. Thus far, it's mainly been molecular detection of this virus, but there are already a couple of candidate antibody detection products by which you could detect the antibody response to this virus, and I believe that with time, you could screen a population. An antibody approach could allow for better tracking and surveillance of an outbreak in a population. But in the meantime, many scientists are reliant on the PCR test. The sample in Priya's lab came back positive. Just one more step in the virus's seemingly unstoppable global spread. The hugely exponential manner in which it has spread, there is now a sense of alarm. By early February, the total number of the confirmed cases had grown to over 31,000 across the world, including 638 fatalities. And alarmingly, even seemingly healthy adults could be struck down, including one of the doctors who first spotted the outbreak in Wuhan. The emerging profile from COVID-19 is that the disease is most dangerous to certain subgroups of the population. The vast majority of people who have died have been over the age of 60, but we do also see that there are a, a small number of people uh, who are thought to be relatively fit and healthy and in their 30s who have also died from the virus. And it's unclear why that is the case. But with little time available to study COVID-19, there were still many questions scientists were grappling with. For instance, are children somehow less vulnerable to the virus? In China, children aged nine and under only made up just 1% of the total number of infections. Whether this is an accurate picture, or if, for example, infection in children is frequently too mild to be detected, remains to be seen. Despite the many challenges faced, there's one aspect of COVID-19 that's providing some hope to scientists the high survival rate among the infected. Coronavirus seems to be one that spreads very easily, but as it seems at the moment, its mortality is relatively low. 2% um, is the current figure. It may even be lower because we do not take account of all the people that are infected but don't have disease, okay? We're measuring usually only the number of people that are diseased. There would be a lot more people, possibly, that are infected. One approach to tackling the novel coronavirus involved the concept of herd immunity. If enough people were to be exposed to the virus and then go on to develop immunity, a natural firebreak in transmission would occur. But how many cases would be needed and at what cost? And crucially, it assumes that people cannot get the disease more than once, which is as yet unknown. 
given the pace at which the virus was spreading, this was a theory at risk of becoming a reality. If everyone keeps infecting, say, three people and, and every four days there's another generation, you can see how within a month you can have thousands of cases. The prospect of herd immunity, however, has several drawbacks. Hospitals will have to cope with a massive influx of patients, overwhelming already strained medical resources. And the question of whether widespread natural immunity would actually emerge remains unknown. The virus may itself evolve quickly, sidestepping any immunity we do develop. This has been the case for one of the most persistent yet elusive viral infections we have all battled with, the common cold. How our collective immune systems respond to the new coronavirus over time remains one of the great unknowns. Humans have no immunity to this virus because they've never been exposed to it before. So when a new virus like COVID-19 enters human populations, everybody is at risk. That's one difference. Influenza, there's a background of immunity which somehow tempers the infection so that it's not so vicious as a new virus that enters human populations for the first time. The risks of collective inaction against such an emerging virus are staggering. Research from Imperial College in London underscores the scale of devastation the virus and its disease would wreak on the global population if the outbreak was simply let to run its course. The researchers estimate that a jaw-dropping 7 billion people would become infected and some 40 million would die from the disease if there was no intervention. By taking drastic action, however, and reducing social contact, of course those numbers can be hugely scaled down. I don't think any of us can accept death from any virus. So we need to develop other tools for other diseases, such as coronavirus, because these are common viruses. And if they continue to emerge, we need a vaccine. As new, untested and theoretical options were being considered, there was now only one concrete way of containing the spread of COVID-19, and that was by means of aggressive testing, tracing and suppression, keeping the sickest in hospitals for treatment and ensuring the general population is kept isolated to prevent further transmission. A combination of these tactics has the potential to save tens of millions of lives, all while racing against time to find a vaccine. The total number of cases had grown to over 31,000 across the world. The hugely exponential manner in which it has spread, there is now a sense of alarm. If it comes too quickly, then health services get overwhelmed and they can't cope and mortality rates increase. Humans have no immunity to this virus because they've never been exposed to it before. As more and more countries implemented strict quarantine and community controls to stem the spread of the new coronavirus, scientists were in a race against time to create a vaccine. A vaccine is something that's generally injected and it prevents infection. So if you're given this, it will protect you from uh, infection with a particular virus. The way a vaccine works, you're given a part or, or an inactivated version of, of that virus. Your body raises an, an immune response against that and it remembers that. So if you come across that virus again in months or even years time, um, that response is much quicker and protects you against that virus. There are many components involved in making a vaccine. Scientists at this lab in Oxford in England are focused on creating the antigen. An antigen is the protein on the surface of the virus that causes your immune system to react. A key part of a vaccine, an antigen triggers your body to go into defense mode. As soon as the sequence of the virus was available, we've used that to synthesize some of the proteins from the surface of the virus. We can make and purify the protein and then make that available to researchers, vaccine companies, diagnostic companies around the world to use. Once an antigen is available, there are still many complex scientific steps in vaccine development, including animal testing, 
before very carefully controlled tests on humans are conducted to ensure it is safe and effective. Only then could a potential vaccine be offered to the public. There are candidate vaccines available, uh, but they will have to go through the process of clinical trials before this can be said it's safe for use uh, uh, anywhere in the world. In the urgent pursuit of a defense against COVID-19, a host of vaccines with different ways of generating immunity were being developed. Amongst the candidates is one designed around the virus's characteristic spike protein, which it uses to latch onto and infect human cells. The hope is that the vaccine will train our immune systems to recognize and respond to these proteins on the virus. The complexity of developing long-lasting protection means that it will be many months before a vaccine can be administered to the general public. The task is potentially made even more challenging as viruses are often able to mutate. And once this takes place, a vaccine developed for a specific strain of a virus may then prove ineffective. Viruses mutate in nature because sometimes when they reproduce, they make a mistake. And then that's conserved in the DNA and the genetics of that organism, and it continues in future generations. Another way is an abrupt reassortment episode when there's a confusion between two viruses in the same cell, and they end up combining their material in a certain way that causes a new virus. Already some scientists in Beijing claim that the virus has evolved into two distinct strands, the L-type and the S-type. The S-type being the first strain was likely to have emerged when the virus jumped from animals to humans. The L-type emerging soon after that, but is according to researchers, the more prevalent strand. But others, including the World Health Organization, say such mutations are normal in any virus and are insignificant. It also does not seem to affect the way the virus works and the symptoms it causes. In parallel to the pursuit of vaccines, a huge range of other clinical approaches were being rapidly trialed, including repurposing existing medicines. These therapies include some novel strategies, such as using the blood plasma of recovered patients. In their body, they have this molecule called antibody in their blood. This can prevent the virus to infect other people or at least reduce the symptom. Basically, you have this recover patients, donate the blood after purification and give to the existing patients. But several risks remain with its technique and more research is needed to understand just how effective and safe it is. Using these sort of therapies, it's very difficult to, to scale up, and it would be hard to imagine how you can treat thousands of per people in this way. Another approach doctors were trying involves antivirals, a class of medications that fight viruses by suppressing their ability to replicate inside the host. If we can find an antiviral treatment that works, then this will definitely be a game changer because, you know, if you've got a treatment for a disease, then, then, then obviously the implications of spread are, are, are far different. In Wuhan, some of the first patients to become seriously ill were starting to make a recovery. After receiving respiratory support and a course of injections of antibodies to help his immune system, there was hope for Wang Wei's father. <laughs> Wang Wei's father was discharged back home, but his parents remained cautious. Wang Wei's father was one of the fortunate ones thanks to medical treatment for the symptoms. Meanwhile, as the world waited for a vaccine, more practical immediate solutions were put in place. Thorough hand washing with soap or the use of hand sanitizers became the mantra to prevent the easy spread of the virus. Contact tracing was stepped up with suspect cases placed under quarantine. For the rest of us, 
social distancing was encouraged to limit the possible spread of the virus. And in some countries, government-sanctioned curfews were imposed. This is a disease spread through the community, and therefore the solution lies with the community, and the community has to be honest, you know? If you're a contact and you're put in quarantine, please comply. Practice the cough etiquette, practice the social distancing. Social distancing has been established as a vital intervention to delay the peak of the outbreak. Because of the exponential scale at which the virus spreads, even a partial reduction in contacts can lead to a huge drop in transmission. If an average person infects another 2.5 people, after 30 days, some 406 people would be infected from the one original case. But if social distancing can just halve the number of transmissions from day one, after 30 days, only 15 people would be infected. There's so much that the community can do to combat this, and this sort of community engagement needs to be, you know, another aspect. By early March, a tipping point was reached. The number of cases outside of China was growing faster than in China itself. It was bearing the hallmarks of a pandemic. How that would play out may be affected by seasonality. In the past, changes in weather have helped curb diseases. I don't think it's the Chinese New Year, the mass movement that triggered the outbreak. Instead, it's the winter, the winter seasons and the live animal market activities. Because the virus survived in the environment longer on the cold environment. This theory implies that cold winter conditions have favored the spread of the virus and suggest that it could return in the Northern Hemisphere's winter. But the science is uncertain, and others doubt the virus is weather dependent. Will it come back next Northern Hemisphere winter? That is suggesting that it's going to go away, and I would argue that that's unlikely. I think we can continue to anticipate future epicenters. The complete eradication of a virus is hard to achieve. Even if this coronavirus was somehow to be eradicated among humans, if it continues to survive in its natural form in animal hosts, the re-emergence back into humans again is possible. And it could, in fact, establish itself as a common respiratory virus. The SARS emergence is thought to have been a one-time event. And it's thought now that it's gone from natural occurrence. It's not clear what the outcome will be, but that's the danger of these emerging infections. It's not what's known, it's what's not known. Their potential is never known when they first emerge. The SARS outbreak in 2003 took the world by surprise. It lasted a total of nine months before the virus was eradicated worldwide. Experts predict that the SARS-CoV-19 and its attendant disease could persist for much longer. But it seems the countries that were directly affected by the SARS outbreak have now emerged stronger, implementing key containment strategies swiftly. We've learned that communication is vital, that sharing of information is vital. Conventional outbreak response efforts work, and it has to be done with speed and rigor and thoroughness, and it has to be done with full community engagement. If we don't change the way we live, we farm, we eat, then it's going to happen again and again. By the end of March, there was a faint glimmer of hope for those back at Ground Zero in Wuhan. We definitely are seeing the uh, numbers drastically coming down. The Chinese people really treated this as a war to, uh, with this invisible enemy, right? So we definitely feel we're very close to having it defeated. With a sharp drop in new domestic cases of COVID-19, China was beginning to gain the upper hand against the virus. As it emerged, seemingly on the other side of the battle, scarred, shaken but optimistic, the country offered its hard-earned expertise to the rest of the world, whose fight against the virus had only just begun. While other countries struggled under ever higher case numbers, China and even Wuhan began a tentative return to normality. Residents were allowed to leave their compounds 
for the first time in many weeks, and business began to resume. It's definitely liberating, you know, after almost two months of uh, quarantine, to be able to even, you know, walk, just walk outside within your neighborhood. People still are going to wear facial masks going out. They're still going to keep their uh, social distancing because now everybody in Wuhan feels a responsibility to not let something like this happen again. The city was gradually reopening itself, even as the rest of the world was closing down. For now, China's aggressive actions appear to have blunted the threat. If the rest of the world can impose strict measures, the bleakest predictions may not materialize. The search for a vaccine against COVID-19 will take some time, and there is no guarantee one will work. That's why experts say the best protection against a viral outbreak may not lie in research labs. It's very wrong to think that medical science can stop an outbreak. What can stop an outbreak is behavioral science. People understanding what's causing the infection and how they can protect themselves. That's the best way forward, the best way to stop an outbreak.